nice to see you all again. We've got a quicker talk today, so it's less intense than the others. Um, kind of going through the basics of cataract surgery and refraction and optics. Um, so you won't be sat here for an hour. Um, hopefully you'll find it useful. There shouldn't be too much coming up in the Duke Elder in depth about refraction and optics. Definitely for part one, get your hands on the clinical optics book, tried and tested, go through that a couple of times. But for today, we'll just get started. Okay, um, so I know you all know already what a cataract is. So it accounts for about 40% of worldwide blindness. And because of the inequity of, of healthcare, 99% um, of the cases are in developing countries, sadly. And for a relatively, well, a completely benign condition and which is easily treatable, its uh, impact can be very significant, especially if you are living in one of those developing areas. Um, people who can't provide for their families or children whose parents have cataracts who are now forced to work, it can have massive consequences. So being able to manage it is extremely important. Um, so cataract, a clouding of the lens. Age-related cataract is the most common. So age is one of the risk factors. Afro-Caribbean, uh, steroid use, diabetes. Um, so I think Yaris touched on this. So where the glucose in our bloodstream, um, which enters the cells, gets converted into sorbitol. And that sorbitol has a hyperosmotic effect on the lens. So then it draws water in, the lens swells and it disrupts the you know, regularly arranged fibrils and causes clouding. Um, another sort of um, hypothesis is that's being investigated, especially for people with type one diabetes, is this um, question of Auto insulin autoantibody. So some studies have found that when these type 1 diabetics start their insulin therapy, that's when their cataract starts. So they're wondering if there's some sort of immune autoimmune process going on, which triggers um, the cataract to form, which is a little bit like what we see in thyroid eye disease, this autoimmune process. It targets the orbits. We don't know why. Um, smoking and then any kind of ocular trauma, um, anything blunt penetrating which might disrupt the fibrils in the lens and cause clouding. And then you've got your systemic conditions. So a lot of conditions are directly associated with cataracts. Um, that can include uh, things like myotonic dystrophy, uh, Wilson's disease and Marfan syndrome. So you presentation of cataract, very straightforward. Um, often the patient will present with just a decrease in visual acuity and they'll find that they've got halos around light, so things glare, especially in dim light. Um, they'll have difficulty seeing in low lit conditions. Um, monocular diplopia, which we touched on a couple of weeks ago. So when you're covering up the good eye, the double vision persists, but when you cover up the bad eye, it goes away. And patients might have multiple changes in prescription with no improvement. Um, this isn't a particularly common thing, but change in refraction. So when patients develop a cataract and it gets quite mature, they can develop a myopic shift. So they'll become uh, progressively more short sighted. Um, and you might have someone who perhaps they needed reading glasses. And now because of the cataract, they find that they no longer need them. And actually reading up close is quite easy. Um, but that's not a change which is um, long, long lived. So the a vision will get worse again. And then a change in fundal view. So often patients will come to clinic, um, they'll do the dilate, dilated fundoscopy, have a look through the slit lamp, and they'll, they'll tell the patient, oh, you've got the start of a cataract. And the patient will have absolutely no idea. They'll feel that their vision is fine. But it's this classic difficulty looking in before the patient has difficulty looking out. And then we've got uncommon consequences of cataract. Um, which I think Yara again has taught us about. So one of them is phycomorphic glaucoma. So the lens um, can cause the iris to bow um, forward. So it, it kind of moves anteriorly and obstructs the outflow angle um, and causes the increase in pressure in the eye. And then you've got phycolytic glaucoma and that's when so soluble lens proteins um, leak out and they block the trabecular meshwork um, causing the same problem. Um, okay and this was just to we'll go into this into a bit more detail in a minute 
but it was just to demonstrate the myopic shift. So uh, normal vision, your light rays focus directly onto your retina, give you a lovely clear image. And with the my myopia, that image is focused in front of the retina. So that's someone who's short-sighted. Um, so we'll just uh, revisit the structure of the lens very quickly. Um, so we've got a lovely biconvex lens. Um, and you can kind of think of it like a peanut, an M&M &M peanut. So the um, nut is the nucleus in the center. Um, the chocolate is the cortex, which is around the nucleus. And then the crispy shell is the capsule, which encases the lens. And that is separated into an anterior part and a posterior part. And at the equator of the lens, um, you get... Ooh, you get um, a germinal layer of cells. So these are the cells which will um, renew the fibres within the lens. Um, and also at the anterior portion of the lens, we've got an active um, potassium sodium ion pump. So you've got uh, potassium going inside and sodium flowing out. You also get active transport of amino acids um, from the aqueous humour. So the aqueous human nourishes the lens with proteins and ions. And this um, ATPase pump, that maintains the osmolarity of the lens and keeps it in its nice, um, nice fixed shape. So if it's hyperosmotic, it will retain a lot of fluid, it will swell. Um, and if the osmolarity is not right, the structure will change. Uh, and on the posterior portion, that's where we get free diffusion of ions and solutes and water. So this pump keeps everything moving quite nicely across. Um, is there anything else I wanted to mention to you about that? Nope, I think that's fine. Okay, so these are our most common types of cataract. So we've got a nuclear sclerotic cataract, um, and that usually presents with a kind of yellowing, or here it's a bit greenish brown, um, change of colour in the centre of the eye, which then moves outwards. And this is the type of cataract that causes the myopic shift that we were talking about. Um, and that can be referred to as second sight. So it's like a patient's got great vision up close all of a sudden, which generally fades away. And then you've got something called a cortical cataract. So that starts from the cortex and moves inwards towards the nucleus, whereas this one started in the nucleus and moved outwards. Um, cortical cataracts, you generally see them in people with diabetes. And these are the type of cataracts which um, give you the symptoms of glare, halos around lights, um, and people find it difficult to read up close. And then you've got posterior capsular cataract. Um, so this is the type of cataract which causes changes in night vision. Um, and this one presents uh, quite quickly, so it develops quite quickly, sorry. So it's usually over months, whereas, you know, these two might be over years. Okay. Um, so when you're seeing a patient before a cataract assessment, they, uh, they're come for a preoperative assessment. And there are lots of aspects to this. Um, but one of the most important is biometry. So what this process does, it allows the surgeon to pick the correct power of the lens that they're going to insert. So it involves doing an ultrasound measurement of the length of the eye and measuring the curvature of the cornea using keratotomy. And there's a special formula that the surgeons use to calculate this. Now P refers to the power of the lens and the unit is diopters and that's the big D. A is a constant and that differs between which between different lenses, the material, the fibre, it changes for each lens. K, that's the corneal um, refractive power and L is the axial length of the eye. Um, and they'll use this to calculate exactly what power they need for the lens. Um, but the intraocular lens that they insert can't accommodate like the natural lens. So you have to have a discussion with the patient about what kind of vision they want to aim for after surgery. So do they want to be able to see far away and just use glasses up, um, up close to reading or vice versa? 
and most patients will opt um, to be able to see at distance and then just use glasses for near, near reading, near vision. Okay, so that's just reminded me. Um, so the normal power of an intraocular lens that will be inserted is usually around 19 to 22. Okay, now someone who's more short-sighted will often need a lower powered lens. So they might need something like 18, 17, 16. And someone who is um, far-sighted might need even higher powered lenses. And I'll explain to you a, a bit about why and how that works with this slide. Okay, so the power of a lens measured in diopters, um, which the unit for that is meters to the minus one, it's calculated by one divided by the focal length. Okay, so the focal length is just the distance at which um, the image appears to be focused. So after it's gone through refraction, the distance at which it gets focused is the focal length. So when parallel light rays enter, oh, that's a terrible, terrible line, um, they'll converge. So these are biconvex lenses. Um, they're converging at a point 10 centimetres away from the lens. So that focal length is 10 centimetres. So to calculate the power of this particular lens, oh, that's a terrible line, but you get the idea. Um, to calculate the power of the lens, you'd convert this into metres, so that's 0.1 metres, and then do 1 divided by that, which should give you 10. Um, so the power of that lens is 10D. Oh, no, no. Um, so I just wrote 10 centimetres there, but you'd have to, calc you'd have to convert it into metres. So that 10 would be 0.1 metres. So focal length would be 1 over 0.1, which would give you a power of 10. So that lens would be a power of, that would be a power of 10D. Um, and, and you can see for this, for this lens here, the light rays are having to travel farther before they converge. Um, so if we calculate the power for this lens, that would be 1, oh dear. Anyway, that would be 1 over 0.3, which I think gives you 3D. So you can see that the power of the lens above, so this lens, the 10D, is stronger than the 3D. The ability for this lens to converge light rays is stronger than the one below. So if you're thinking about someone who's short-sighted, the image is going to converge in front of their retina. So if their retina's here, in someone who's short-sighted or got a myopic eye, the image that they're looking at will converge in front of their retina. So if you're inserting an intraocular lens, you don't want one particularly that's going to make that converge even further forward. So you don't want a strong, particularly strong lens. You would want a lens which would allow you, which would allow the light rays to travel farther so that they can converge on the retina. So down here, you perhaps want a less strong lens because you can see these light rays are having to travel a little bit further to converge at the correct point. So when we say that short-sighted people would want a power maybe 19 or less, it's to allow those rays to come to a focus point on the retina. Okay. And your pre-op um, assessment also includes the regular things, so your medical assessment. Is this person on any anticoagulants? Warfarin specifically, you don't need to um, hold it for a cataract operation, but they do need to be within a therapeutic range. Tansulosin is another important one to be aware of. Um, that's the only alpha blocker which causes floppy iris syndrome, um, which can cause quite significant problems during surgery. So that's true to be aware of. And then obviously the general obs of the patient, if they are hypertensive on the day, and that hypertension is not well controlled. If you have a head with the surgery, complications are um, sight threatening and they can go blind. Um, so patients can get, I guess, quite angry when they find out that their high, you know, their blood pressure is quite high and you have to cancel the operation. But if the, if they're going to go blind, 
it's not worth it. Um, then when you see this patient in clinic, you have to think, is this the type of patient that can lie on a table supine for 20 minutes? Are they an elderly arthritic patient with a dodgy neck who can't lie flat? Um, if that's the case, then you're not going to be able to go ahead with this kind of surgery. And then last but not least, obviously informed consent, um, explaining what the procedure is, risks, benefits, making sure that they're aware that this kind of surgery, cataract surgery, does not guarantee the um, their ideal visual outcome. Um, sometimes the lenses aren't per perfect, sometimes the patient has maculopathy, which also means their vision won't be exquisite. Um, so it's just really important to make sure they're aware of that and that they might still need glasses even after the surgery. These are just some quick definitions to be aware of. So fakia, natural lens in situ, pseudophakia, the cataracts are removed and we've got a nice intraocular lens implanted. And then aphakia, the cataracts are removed without any lens being implanted. And there are sort of the main types of lenses are monofocal and multifocal. Um, monofocal lenses include toric lenses, um, which I'll talk about in, in a bit. Um, and that just allows your vision to be in focus at one point, either near, far or intermediate. Um, and they're particularly useful for correcting astigmatism. So um, in actual, is there a definitive upper limit? I'd say just under 140, probably um, just the general kind of GP guidelines. Um, but that would just be me off the top of my head thinking, I don't know for sure, but yeah, I can do a quick quick search and find out. Um, um, patient, yeah, so they might need still, so with toric lenses, the patient still might need to wear glasses uh, for reading or sometimes even at distance vision. Um, and multifocal, that allows you to see near and far, and it's a bit like wearing very focal glasses. Um, but on the NHS, I don't believe we tend to use those very much. I think it's generally the monofocal toric lenses that we go with, just for ease of use. Okay. Um, I probably lots of you have seen a cataract surgery already, or if you haven't, this is a really nice video that I found. Um, it's only seven minutes and it's narrated by the surgeon and it just shows you all the key steps. Um, so if you want to just refresh your memory, um, that's a nice one you can you can have a read of. Um, oh, you're there. Yeah, it's done it. There we go. Um, so some of the key steps, you're making a small incision at the side of the cornea. Um, some surgeons will insert a blue dye which stains the capsule so you can easily see what you're doing. And then they'll make a five millimeter anterior capsular capsular excess. So they'll just take off that kind of anterior capsule and then insert the, what do you call it? What's the probe called? The fakia probe, I can't remember, um, and break down the lens um, and remove all of that, clean the posterior capsule and then insert the intraocular lens. Um, Phycomorsification and IOL is a chosen method in the UK. In other parts of the world, they use um, other methods. Um, anesthesia, typically most of the cataract surgery we do is uh, topical. The only problem with this is that it's a non um, a kinetic method, so patients can still move their eyes during surgery, um, which if you're an experienced surgeon and your patient's not particularly nervous and can keep still, it's absolutely fine. But sometimes um, if you've got, perhaps it's your first surgery or the patient's very nervous, you might want to use a subtenens or peribulba block um, because they stop the patient from being able to move their eyes. Um, retrobulba is being less and less used just because of the risk of retrobulba hemorrhage. Um, and you can always provide um, sedation, benzos, um, and sometimes GA is still an option if you really need it. Okay, this is one of the most um, significant complications of cataract surgery. Um, and five to six percent of all trainees will experience this at some point during their training. Um, and this is um, posterior capsular rupture. So what happens here is that the surgeon with the, that's it, the FICO tip um, can pierce the posterior part of the capsule. 
and what um, the surgeon might notice is that the anterior chamber becomes deeper and deeper as a result of this because vitreous is going to be flowing through into the anterior chamber potentially um, raising the intraocular pressure and he'll find or she will find that the lens fragments um, become less and less visible because they're falling into the vitreous and, and this can be quite damaging to the post-operative outcomes um, so it can cause retinal detachment um, and also uh, just to be aware that it's treated with a vitrectomy so that's just removing the vitreous completely okay and then we've got our post-op complications which you can organize into acute subacute um, Probably the most important one is endophthalmitis, which you might see about four to five days after surgery. And you can see here the patient's got conjunctival injection, they've got a hypopian. Um, sometimes you can see that the cornea becomes a bit cloudy, and this is a terrible, terrible complication. Um, and endophthalmitis, you might want to treat that with um, a quinolone, it's fluoroquinolone, muff. Mofloxacin, I think, is most commonly used, and then you've got levofloxacin or ofloxacin. Uh, visual prognosis is usually not too good. And then subacute, they can develop cystoid macular edema six to eight weeks after. So they might come back presenting with um, blurry vision, difficulty seeing fine detail. And then months to years after, they can get posterior capsule pacification and quite commonly the patient will need to come back for another procedure. And this is an example down here of um, a PCO. It doesn't look particularly exciting on the screen, but in real life it's really pretty. It kind of looks like um, raindrops on a spider's web. And what the surgeon will go and do is they'll make a small hole in the posterior part of the capsule to um, clear the obstruction um, of vision but I think there's a bit of um, discrepancy at the moment about how big to make this hole so sometimes the patient will have to go back for another procedure to make it a little bit bigger and then like we said earlier retinal detachment particularly if the posterior capsule um, was breached and you've got the vitreous sort of pulling away at the, at the retina okay and now we're going into some quick um, refraction of the eye. Um, so the ref uh, refraction of the eye is the, abil the ability of the eye to bend light rays and it's determined by the refractive properties of the cornea and the power for that is 43d and also the natural lens which is 15d and light of course also gets slightly refracted by the aqueous and the vitreous. Um, whenever you're calculating the total refractive power of something it's just an addition equation you just add up all the powers so for a normal eye, it's 58D. So with someone with emetropia, the um, light rays are focused appropriately on the retina and converge at one point. Um, there's no blurriness. They have a completely clear image. So there's no refractive error. Okay. Um, so for someone who's myopic, um, they might have a very strong family history, which is a risk factor. Also, um, doing a lot of up close near reading and work. Um, nutrition's been mentioned, but there's a bit of discrepancy in the literature, literature as to whether that is a risk factor, but generally family history is the strongest one. Um, these patients, I'm sure you'd know, they're able to see clearly close up, but distance vision is blurred. And generally the most common cause is that um, the axial length of the eye is too long. So images get focused in front of the retina. Rarely, it's caused by too great a refractive power. So um, remember we said earlier that patients with cataracts, um, they can have a myopic shift that can cause it, but it's not as common as the length of the eyeball being the problem. And we can combat this by using concave lenses. So these lenses, when the light rays hit, they will slightly diverge them um, so that when they come to focus, they're at the appropriate point on the retina. Okay, and then for our hyperopic eye, so these patients can clearly at a distance, but not close up. Sorry, generally the eyeball is too short a length. 
so you get this image focused um, behind the retina, it's blurry, yeah, caused by a low axial length. Um, so the, the how we can fix this is using convex lenses. So if we look at one at the at the very bottom, and um, that causes the lens the lens to converge the light rays slightly so that they come to converge at the appropriate point on the left on the retina. Um, I don't think you you might have to do this for the Duke Elder. Um, oh, actually, not for part one anymore. But before they used to ask you to draw these out, but now everything's online. You probably shouldn't have to do that. But use just remembering that convex concave lenses or how you treat these things should be enough um, and just um, as a little fact the near point of the eye for a normal eye is usually 25 centimeters what we mean by a normal or near point it's the closest point at which an object can be placed in front of your eye and still remain focused and that's normally 25 centimeters so um, with someone with a hypermetropic eye that near point is farther away, which is why they can see well in the distance, because the light rays are able to converge um, together at a single point on the retina. So that's why um, far distance vision people, you know, they'll move a book further away because their near point is farther away than 25 centimetres. And that's just um, for reference. So when you're at the optician and they're talking about minus lenses and plus lenses, these are the type of lenses that they're referring to. And we've got um, astigmatism. And um, so with astigmatism, there's irregular, there's an irregular um, curvature to the cornea. So instead of being nice and spherical, the cornea is um, a bit more rugby ball shaped. So down here, you can see it's it's got that weird rugby ball shape. Um, and that causes multiple focus points on the retina. So instead of just one, you've got lots of rays um, bouncing around the retina, giving you like a really blurry, unfocused image. Um, we, yeah, like we said earlier, this can be treated by toric lenses. So toric lenses, um, they are thicker in some parts and thinner in other parts. So the red part is, is where it's thickest. And depending on the patient's um, cornea, at the appropriate lens, and it will cause light to be reflected accordingly to needs to be. Um, and then you, we've got corneal and laser surgery as well as treatments. So I know that was kind of a whistle stop tour um, and just focusing on the very, very key things. Um, but uh, we had a question from Chi, I think, was it a couple of weeks ago, um, who was asking about why in afferent pupillary defect do we maintain the ability to accommodate um, but have no light reflex? And I didn't include this because, to be honest, it was far too complicated for me to understand. Um, and essentially, we don't know why, but for those of you who want to delve into the literature a bit more, I've got two of the key things that seem to keep cropping up. Um, and that's that the centre for the near reflex, we haven't particularly defined it yet. Um, they think that it might be more ventral than the pretectal nucleus, which controls the light reflex. Um, why that would mean the near reflex is um, still able to work when someone has an afferent pupillary defect, I'm not sure, I don't know. Um, and there's also the possibility that there are supranuclear influences from the frontal and occipital lobes. Um, I, we don't know yet, but just the important thing to remember is vision is not a prerequisite for the accommodation reflex. Um, it, it doesn't need a light stimulus. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. I'm sorry, Chin, if I didn't quite answer it, but there we go. Um, and that's that. You guys have made it through so many weeks of the Duke Elder. Well done. Okay, I'm just going to get onto the pre quiz, the post quiz now. Can I just say, I even referenced my congratulations slide. I hope you're happy, Aaron. Super happy. 